Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. I'm an alcoholic. Thank you. Um, no, really, thank you for that. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> I have to start by telling the truth. Uh, I get up here and um, I'm terrified and I'm full of fear. And, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm following these incredible speakers. I listened to Jeffrey today and he just blew the roof off the place. And, and, and Travis, who just got up here with this light for Alcoholics Anonymous and this joy for Alcoholics Anonymous in this program. And my head immediately wants to tell me that I don't belong here, that I have nothing to offer, that why did they fly me across the country to talk? And, uh, I should just, you know, go home. And, uh, and that's what my alcoholism does to me. It wants me to be small. It wants me to, you know, it tells me I have nothing to offer the world. And, and I'm also going to be honest and tell you, I am in more pain today than I have been in my entire sobriety. But, uh, you know, this is a testament to Alcoholics Anonymous and the work we do here is the fact that even throughout all the pain that I'm experiencing, I'm able to get on that plane and put one foot in front of the other. And a thought of a drink has not occurred to me once through everything I'm going through. And that has nothing, think, that has nothing to do with me. That has nothing to do with, you know, me being special or unique. It has to do with the power of opening the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and, you know, taking the direction that's outlined in that book. And that's all that is. And uh, I remember coming in and out of the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous for so many years and wanting the solution to be anything other than the 12 steps, wanting it to be anything other than a God. I wanted it to be a man. I wanted it to be a job. I wanted it to be, you know, I, I brought babies into this world thinking they were going to be my solution. I wanted it to be anything outside of myself. In fact, that's what I thought it would be. I, my, my greatest delusion has always been that, you know, if I just got married and had 2.5 children and, you know, had the white picket fence and did all that good stuff, you know, got a, got a certain you know, like got a six figure income and did all this stuff that I would be okay. Cause I look around and I see my siblings doing it and I see people I know doing it and they, they have the marriage, they have the car, they have the life and, and they're happy and they, they're okay with themselves. And, and that just doesn't work for me. You know, that doesn't work for me. And, and coming into AA for so many years thinking alcohol was my problem. And I'm not saying alcohol is not a problem because I promise you the second I pick up a drink, it is a problem. Anybody who's ever had a drink with me knows it's a problem. Um, you know, and, um, but the truth is, is for so many years, I, I come in and out of the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and I put the drink down, I get separated from alcohol and, uh, and everything gets worse. Everything gets worse. I think that if you just remove alcohol, I will get better. And, and that's not the case. You know, I, I just feel more and more uncomfortable and it gets more painful living in my skin. And eventually I pick up a drink regardless of what the consequences look like. And, and it wasn't until I finally came in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous completely broken and willing to do whatever you guys told me to do and sat down with a woman who opened up that book with me and explained to me what alcoholism was that I learned that alcohol, you know, alcohol really wasn't my problem. It was my solution. What my real problem is, is sobriety. I don't know how to live sober. Because I wake up every day with a head that tells me I don't deserve to be here, that there's something wrong with me, that, you know, it, it, I'm just completely driven by these hundred forms of fear, self-seeking, self-delusion, self-pity, all that stuff the big book talks about. And you know what? That stuff was in me well before I picked up a drink. Like that was the little kid that I was. That was the little kid who went to school and thought everybody hated her. And, you know, I went to church on Sunday and you got, and my, they were talking about this God. My father was a Presbyterian minister. There was no lack of God in my life. Believe me, there was no lack of God. I just wanted nothing to do with that God. You know, because that God that they were talking about, Travis touched on it, like this faraway sky daddy God that I couldn't connect with. In fact, I not only couldn't connect with that God, but I felt judged by that God. I heard every Sunday that if I was a good little girl, I went to this happy little place in the sky. And if I was a bad girl, I burned in this fiery pit. And I wasn't good. I wasn't good. I was a liar. I was a sneak. I was a manipulator. I wanted attention all the time. I knew I wasn't good inherently deep down. I always knew I was bad. I always knew there was something wrong with me. So you're telling me coming into AA that this God idea is going to work for me. And I tell you, you, you don't know what you're talking about. This is not going to work for me. You know, I also keep coming in Alcoholics Anonymous and, you know, you want me to stop drinking. 
Like, I, th- I, this is the problem. Like, thank God for the traditions of Alcoholics the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. I came in and out of these rooms for years without the desire to stop. And you, none of you ever judged me. None of you ever asked me to leave. You all kept asking me to keep coming back. No matter how many, how many of your men I dated and how many times I lied to you, you know, you, yeah, it was a lot. Um, <laughs> but like nobody, nobody ever asked me to leave and nobody ever questioned what my desire was. They just kept saying, keep coming back. I didn't have a desire to stop. I had a desire for the consequences to stop. That's it. I wanted to stop going to jail. I wanted to get my kids back. I wanted my family to talk to me. I wanted to keep a job or a roof over my head. And I couldn't do that. I just couldn't do that. And I didn't know why. You know, and I didn't want to be separated from the one thing that had ever worked for me. The one thing that had, you know, fixed what was wrong inside of me, alcohol, that drink that I picked up at the age of 15 years old. The second I put that in my body and experienced that sense of ease and comfort, and everything was okay. Everything was right with the world for the first time. I never wanted to be separated from that drink. And, um, and I did everything I could to not be separated. In the beginning, it was amazing. It was fun. It was a party. You know, I, I, uh, from the very beginning, I had that allergy that the book talks about. I didn't really, you know, know what to call it. I just know that I didn't drink like my friends. I know I was that sloppy drunk that got dropped off on my parents' front doorstep with a lot of explanations and apologies. Um, you know, I just could never drink like normal people. Our book says that many of us started out as moderate to hard drinkers and then progressed to, you know, the real alcoholic. I think I might have skipped the moderate part. And I'm not saying that because I think I'm a real badass or anything. I'm, I'm saying that because our book defines a moderate drinker or someone who can put down alcohol with little trouble. And that was never my experience because once I picked up alcohol and realized the effect it could produce for me, I never wanted to put it down. And like when I did have to put it down, like when I got pregnant at the age of 19, like it was painful. What separates me from the normal drinker, like my siblings, is like, you know, they're picking out nursery furniture and baby names, and I'm crawling out of my skin, counting the days like it's a prison sentence, like, get this kid out of me so I can drink again. And I have no interest in being a parent, by the way. Zero. Like, none. I am way too selfish and self-centered. All I want is this kid out of me so I can start drinking again, and I can again experience that sense of ease and comfort that comes with that first drink, and that's exactly what I do. And then you fast forward seven years later second marriage, second pregnancy, and I can't stay sober. And I don't want to. I don't care about the child that I'm carrying. I don't care about anybody but myself. I don't care about anybody. All I care about is my own pain, and I want it to stop. And I'm consumed with this shame for what I'm doing, and I can't tell anybody the way I'm living. And as a direct result of everything I did during that pregnancy, I give birth to a a little boy who is three months premature and he is two pounds. And the first time I see him, he's on life support and he can't breathe on his own. He can't be held. And the second I see him, all the love that was missing during that pregnancy shows up in that moment. I see my little boy and I love him as much as I'm capable of loving any human being at that point in my life. But what comes with that love is this overwhelming sense of shame and guilt because I know I did that to him. I knew I put him in that condition. I knew he couldn't breathe because of me. I knew he couldn't be held because of me. I knew I did that. And the only thing that will ever take away that type of shame and guilt is alcohol for me. And I need more and I need more and I need more. You know, when our literature says like many of us had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them, even though we would have liked to. I felt like I resonate with that so deeply because I wanted to be a good mother. I wanted to be a good wife. I wanted to be a good sister and daughter, but I did not have the power to do that because the kind of mother that I am, I nod out and I drink drop my kid on the floor. I leave my kid in the car in a bad neighborhood and go around the corner to get a drink and come right back. That's the kind of mother I am. I'm the kind of mother who gets locked up. I get arrested with my eight month old son in the car and my husband has to come to the police station and pick up our baby. And I remember coming home from the, the, uh, you know, I got locked up and I got bailed out the next day and I got, I I came home the next day and my husband is leaving. He's got everything packed and he's going to take our child. And I start begging and pleading with him, like, no, you can't do this. 
you can't do this. I promise him everything. I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. I beg and I plead. I think I threatened suicide. It was really big on doing that to everybody. Uh, and, um, you know, and I meant every single one of those promises when I was saying them. I absolutely did. And finally he stopped and he looked at me and he said, okay, all right, I'll, I'll, I will stay on one condition. You go to treatment today and you get sober today. And I looked at that man and I looked at my little boy and I knew he was going to walk out the door. And I said, no, I said, no, because what my head tells me is this, he'll come back. I'll bring my son back. I'll figure this out tomorrow. I'll work this out tomorrow, but I need a drink now. I need a drink now. And after he leaves, he does not come back. And I am, I am crushed by this shame and guilt, but I cannot be separated from the one thing that is giving me relief, and that's alcohol. And frankly, it's not even giving me that much relief anymore, but it's the only thing I got. And I'm drinking myself nearly to death, and I don't even care at this point. I simply just don't want to wake up in the morning, but I'm too much of a coward to kill myself, so I just drink, and I just drink, and I just drink till my mother finds me, at, you know, 75 pounds with a fever of 106, literally dying. And this woman shows up, and she brings me to the hospital, and, you know, it's so funny. We were just talking about this the other day. We're laughing about it now because it's really sick, but I, I refuse to go to the hospital. And the fact that I can laugh about this with my mother today, she finds me, I'm, I'm not even lying, exaggerating about my weight and my, my fever. And my mother is a nurse practitioner, by the way. And so I refuse to go to the hospital because I don't want to die. And I'm making this woman's life a living hell. And I'm like, I'm not going. And she's like, fine. Um, We'll take you to urgent care, and if they say you have to go, will you go? And I said, fine. The urgent care people gave them their money back and told them to leave and looked at them like they were insane for even bringing me in the door. But that's the kind of stuff I do to people. And the entire time my mother is standing by my bedside, all I'm doing is screaming at her and cursing her out and telling her, why did you do this? Why did you do this? Why didn't you just let me die? Because I don't care about her. I don't care about her pain. I don't ask, I don't care that I'm asking a parent to bury their child. I don't care about abandoning my children or my husband. I don't care about my siblings. I don't care about anybody but me and my own pain. And I just want it to end. And it, you know, it didn't end, uh, <laughs> didn't end for a really long time. I would love to tell you all these consequences that started happening. All this loss that I was experiencing was enough to get me to stop. The consequences of that magnitude still aren't bigger than alcohol for me. You know, I, I would love to tell you that losing custody of both of my children got me to stop, but it didn't. I would love to tell you that the 11 felonies I ended up racking up was enough to get me to stop, but it was not. It just wasn't. And I'm not here to talk of like the consequences are sort of irrelevant to, you know, my alcoholism because they're not what make me an alcoholic. So if you're hearing me today and you're, you, you can't, you know, identify with the fact that I went to state prison or the fact that I lost custody of my children or any of that. It doesn't really matter because that's not what my problem is. That's just what happens when I put a drink in me. The reason I talk about it is the fact that there was no consequence that was ever going to be great enough until it came from within. No external consequence was ever going to be big enough because I didn't care. And, um, you know, I finally started coming in and out of the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and my son was six years old and being raised by another woman and calling her mom and I'm consumed with rage and resentment and self-pity and like, how dare you steal my kid from me as if I didn't just abandon her, you know, and I come in the rooms of AA and you guys are all happy, joyous and free and I absolutely hate your guts. I heard Jeffrey talking about the fact that, uh, you know, he, he, he was attracted to it. I was not, I was like... I was almost repelled by it because <laughs> you had something I was never going to have. You had freedom. You had redemption. And I walk in there with all the shame for what I did to my children. I walk in there with all the shame for the things that I've done. And I believe in my soul that I will never be forgiven and I will never be redeemed for the things that I've done. That you, the, the redemption and freedom that you've experienced here is not available to it, to an alcoholic like me. It's just not. And so I come in the rooms and I don't do any work and I leave and I go back out over and over and over again. I can't even say I relapsed because I never did any work. Um, that would be dishonest. <laughs> I had brief periods where law enforcement separated me from alcohol and that's about all I was able to put together. And this just went on, you know, for many years. And like a big part of the shame that I was experiencing was that for so long, 
I just believed that I was this scumbag lowlife that was beyond saving, that I chose to be this way, that I chose alcohol over my children. And it wasn't until a woman in Alcoholics Anonymous opened up the book with me to There is a Solution where it explains for reasons yet obscure, most alcoholics have lost the power of choice when it comes to a drink, that I experienced a little bit of freedom from that. Where for the first time in my entire life, I knew that I wasn't this piece of garbage that was not worth this redemption. I knew I was an alcoholic and alcohol had that much power over me and that I needed to find a power bigger than alcohol. And that doesn't mean I wasn't responsible for the things that I did to my children. I will spend the rest of my life making amends for the things that I did to the people I love. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that I need to know and I need to concede to my innermost self that I do not have a choice when it comes to alcohol, drunk or sober. And, um, you know, <laughs> again, like I said, like this thing went on for a really long time. And uh, the consequences piled up and they got really bad. But something happened on May 2nd of 2012. And I had been on a run and it had been really bad, but it wasn't the worst run I'd been on. Um, you know, usually when I was, I was out doing what I was doing, like I had nothing. I ended up in, you know, treatment because I had a bag of clothes and everybody had kicked me out and I was out of, out of ideas. But this time I had a roof over my head. I had a job. I had a car. I had money in my pocket and I wanted to die. The outside just didn't look that bad. It was the inside. I remember being on the highway at like four in the morning and driving to go get a drink. And for the first time in my entire life, I had this overwhelming and overpowering desire to turn my car around and go home and stop doing what I was doing, stop lying to my children, stop lying to my family, stop hurting the people I love. And no matter how powerful that desire was, I could not do it. I just couldn't do it. And I knew in that moment I was drinking against my will. And for the first time in my entire life, I started crying out to this God that I did not even believe in. And I certainly didn't think this God cared about me. And I started screaming to this God, dear God, just please kill me or stop me. A lot of cursing along with that, but a uh, just kill me or stop me. Pounding on the steering wheel, begging God to take me because I just couldn't take another minute of this agony, that jumping off point that the book talks about, where I can't live with it and I can't live without it anymore. I just don't know how to live on this earth. And I would love to tell you that, you know, everything changed. I went and had a drink. But 12 hours later, God, you know, sent law enforcement to intervene. And I got locked up. And uh, that gift of desperation was very short-lived. You know, I had this... Uh, this moment where I will do anything. God, take this from me, remove this from me, just kill me or stop me. And then 48 hours you know, later, and I'm in a holding cell, and this is not the deal that I made with you, God. I <laughs> kind of wanted a treatment bed, some good drugs. I don't want. Um, and I certainly didn't want another arrest on my record. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, all of a sudden I'm scrambling and trying to figure out and manage my way out of the situation. I start calling everybody and nobody's picking up the phone or when they do, they hang up on me because, you know, all these human powers that I'd been relying on and relying on and manipulating for all this time hung up on me and uh, they want nothing more to do with me. And, um, so I went to state prison. And uh, what happened during that time, and I, I learned this in hindsight because I, I don't do very well in Alcoholics Anonymous learning in the moment. I learned while I'm looking back um, that for the 18 months that I was simply physically separated from alcohol, I got worse, not better. Because the only thing that happened is I got separated from a chemical solution and had no other solution in its place. So I start calling home from prison and on a phone account that my parents are paying for and I'm calling home telling them what they need to do for me or, you know, you need to run this errand for me and go pick up my clothes here and fix this for me. And, and they're like, no, we're not doing this. Or I'm writing really long apology letters home about how sorry I am, but if you were better parents or siblings, I wouldn't be here. P.S. Send money. Um, <laughs> and that's what, that's how I show up. Like that selfishness and self-centeredness that the world revolves around me and you're supposed to do things for me. That's how I show up without a drink. And, uh, and after 18 months I get released and, um, and I have ideas still about how I'm going to run my life. And, um, and within 48 hours of me getting home from prison, every single idea I had for my life was ripped out from underneath me and I was left with nothing. I didn't have a phone. I didn't have a job. I didn't have money. I had a recovery house bed. That's all I had. And I ended up 
on the floor of a recovery house bathroom in the fetal position, crying out to this God all over again and asking God, like, what am I supposed to do now? What am I supposed to do now? And because 18 months I haven't a drink in my body and I want to die all over again. Why is this so painful? Why would anybody want to be sober if this is what it feels like? So what do I do now? And the answer came when I, you know, walked up the steps of my old home group and I was presented with God in the eyes of sober members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And like, this was different because I've seen all you happy, joyous and free people before. And I just think you're liars. And I think you're in some cult or you're, I definitely don't think you're sober or you didn't drink the way I drank or, you know, you didn't feel the way I felt. You didn't experience what I experienced. But this time God put people in directly in my path who I drank with. I got loaded with people I knew who were just as low bottom and messed up as me. And these people were sober and they were lit up and they were free. Their very deportment shouted that they had an answer. And I, I knew they didn't do that to themselves. And I can't tell you I was completely sold on this idea, but I can tell you for the first time in my entire life, I had hoped that there was another way. And I was willing to do anything these people told me to do because I was out of ideas. I had burned through every other solution imaginable and none of them had worked. So maybe just maybe this idea that you guys had would work for me. You know, I, I asked a woman to take me through the 12 steps and nothing about that was comfortable. I was still pushing against this whole God idea. You know, I've been looking for God my entire life, right? I'm looking for God when I pick up that bottle and I have that spiritual experience, right? I'm looking to connect with something. That's all I want from a very little girl. I just wanted to feel love and connection. I wanted to feel part of something and I didn't feel that. And when I drank alcohol, I felt that. I had my first spiritual experience at the age of 15 when I picked up that drink. And I'm chasing alcohol, and I made alcohol my God for 20 plus years. And then I come to AA, and they're like, "Well, you you need to find a power bigger than yourself and turn your life over to that." I'm like, "No, I'm not doing that." But I I, I really was out of options at this time, and, and like out of ideas. And I, I remember getting on my knees for that third step prayer. And in that moment, I made probably one of the most important decisions of my entire life. No, pro and um. I kind of missed the moment because I was too busy thinking about myself. It was just awkward and uncomfortable and, you know, we're doing it in front of people. We're kneeling and praying. And I was brought up in a, in a family where we prayed in public at McDonald's. So this was just, I'm not doing this, but I was so willing to do anything at this point. And, uh, I got up from that prayer and that woman slid paper in front of me and told me to start writing. And that's really where everything started to change for me. And it says it right there in our book. Like, Although this decision is a vital and crucial step, it could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of what was blocking us. And so this is where things start to shift for me, where I start putting pen to paper. I can't say in, in, immediately it started to happen because uh, she kind of set me up. She's like, just go write a list of everybody you're angry at. And I'm like, okay, here's 27 pages. Um, <laughs> Because all I see when I come in is the world and these people are often quite wrong, right? I can't get past. I can't get past that. I can't get past column one and column two, like well, you and what you did to me. That's all, I, that's all I bring to the table. And that woman lovingly sat down with me for several hours <laughs> and um, got me to the truth. That fourth column, that shift in perception, where, you know, I'm able to look at this from an entirely different angle. I remember my mother, she got a whole page to herself. I don't know if anybody else has that issue, but like, did anyone else's mom make them an alcoholic? Cause mine did. No, that's what I was convinced though when I came in here. No, uh, you know, my mom, like something happened when I was 15 years old. These three, these three men did something to me that was awful. And my mom's reaction to it was one of, you know, how could you be so stupid? What were you doing? Like, why were you there? All that kind of stuff. And I, and I kind of drank at that for a really long time. And I, I did everything in my power to hurt this woman for 20 years or longer. And, um, and so as we work our way to that fourth column and I, and I, I start seeing this from this different angle and resolutely look for my mistakes, you know, I don't just see what a monster I've been to this woman and how I've been so selfish and, you know, dishonest and how I've been so horrible to her. What I see is that I took this one decision my mother made when I was 15 years old and I allowed it to blind me to every beautiful thing my mother ever did for me my entire life. Every time she brought clothes to rehab or, you know, paid my bail or invited me to Thanksgiving dinner where the rest of the family didn't want me. My mother loved me unconditionally. 
And I could never see that through my resentment. I can't see you through my resentment. I, I, I can't feel God. And so once I start to see this truth, I, I, I want to tell you that I have this experience where I can look the world in the eye again and feel the nearness of my creator. That is not what happened. Not initially. I mean, I've had multiple inventories since then, and I've ex had that experience immediately. But my first one, I felt profoundly and deeply uncomfortable because for the first time in my entire life, I saw the truth of who I was and I hated it. I didn't want to be that person anymore. So getting down on my knees and, you know, for that seven step prayer was easy. You know, they ask if there's anything I'm still clinging to coming in. The bar is so low. I'm not clinging to anything. You can have it all because guess what? Every single one of these defects are causing me consequences. So take them. I have nothing. Fast forward 10 years later, I want to keep this one and this one and this one and this one and this one. I'm going to gossip at work. I'm going to do this. Yeah. And uh, it gets a lot, you know, it's a lot different, but, um, I'm telling you coming in, that, that was the experience. And, uh, and then, you know, I start to feel this, this thing that you guys are talking about, this fundamental idea of God that's deep down within all of us. Cause I, you know, when I sit down and, and finally start making amends to people, you know, cause I've been looking for God out here, up in the sky, in church, in books, trying to intellectualize God, trying to figure out what God is, come to find out when I, start taking these 12 steps and putting them into action, I start to experience God. And that experience really started when I sat down in front of the people that I harmed more than anything in this world. And I didn't say I was sorry. I said I was wrong. And I told them what I did to them. I admitted the things that I had never admitted before because I was that gaslighter. I was like, well, you didn't see, you didn't see what you saw with your own eyes. You didn't hear it. Like I, I was really good at making people crazy. And I, you know, I, I, and I did that and I gave them an opportunity to share with me how I hurt them. And I asked them what I could do to make it right. And you know, it, with this ninth step comes these promises. And I don't know what they do in, in your area, but back in Philadelphia, every time they read the, the ninth step promises, you know, we get to that part and it says, are these extravagant promises? And the whole room's like, we think not. Honestly, I think they're the most extravagant promises I ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> because I never knew, I never believed in a million years that I could know, know a life of freedom and happiness. And when I finally get to step 12 and I'm sitting down with another woman, I finally experience what you guys are talking about. Because for the first time in my life, I see what God has done. God took all those disgusting and shameful things that I thought I could never be redeemed for and never be forgiven for. And he has made them my most useful tools in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because when I sit with a woman and she tells me she drank during her pregnancy or she abandoned her children, I don't judge her. I can look at her right in the eye and say, I know, me too. And that's what God does. And I start to have this experience and I start to feel this power that you guys are talking about. And one day at a time, I realize I'm not thinking about a drink and the outside of my life starts to get better. And I know it's not me doing that. And I would love to tell you that I stayed on this path and everything, you know, um, I did everything, you know, by the book, but that's not the truth. Cause what happens is, is I, you know, I get a couple years under my belt and I think I'm God again, or I think he's God. You know, I've done that twice. I've had two long-term relationships in sobriety and one of them couldn't stay sober and one couldn't stay away from other women. And I stayed too long in both. And I tried to play God in both because it's really easy for me to think I'm turning my will and my life over to a power, to the power of God for me and the care of God for me, but I won't do it for him. Like let him go, let him go because I have an idea of how my life is supposed to look. And I get these pictures in my head and, um, and I want to play God again. And I suffer as a result. You know, I, I remember when COVID hit, you know, I thought I was really doing the deal. 
I thought I had this great thing going on, sponsoring a ton of women. And, um, you know, I had all this stuff going on, keeping busy, keeping busy, keeping busy. And then all of a sudden COVID hit and every human power that I placed in my life got stripped away from me and I'm stuck with me. The relationship started to tank. I, I couldn't go to work. I was stuck in my house all day. Meeting shut down. Zoom is great, but it's different. And all of a sudden I'm stuck and it's just me and God and I'm crawling out of my skin again and I can't figure out what's wrong with me and I'm in pain. And I know a lot of good people who didn't have the grace of the moment that I had where instead of walking out the door to pick up a drink, I picked up the phone and I called another woman in Alcoholics Anonymous and I asked her for help. And what I, what I love today is knowing that I don't know anything and continue to not know anything that I need to continue to remain teachable. You know, I love what Travis said about who in here is in your last 60 days of Alcoholics Anonymous, because we don't even know when it's happening. Alcohol is a subtle foe and I don't even know when it's coming at me unless I'm practicing these steps vigilantly unless I am actively practicing the 10th step, actively practicing that 11th step. And, but when I am doing these things, I get to show up for life on a level that I have never imagined. I get to be present in a life beyond my wildest dreams. And I'm going to say something, you know, some things that may sound strange because Coming into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I had an image of what my life beyond, you know, what a life beyond my wildest dreams was supposed to look like. It was supposed to look like a guy with a six pack and a lot of money, or, you know, it was supposed to look like a lot of external stuff. But I don't look at it that way today. You know, some of the stuff that is beyond my wildest dreams is extremely painful. Some of the things and the gifts that I've experienced in Alcoholics Anonymous are not things that you would consider gifts. In 2015, I got a phone call from my mother telling me that my oldest sister was dead. And I had the gift of being able to know intuitively in that moment how to handle a situation which used to baffle me, that I intuitively knew that this situation was about my mother and it was about my father and it was about her children. And I was given the gift of being in this moment I got to stand next to my mother when she saw her daughter in the casket for the first time. And I got to be there to comfort my mother in the worst moment of her life. And that's not me. That is absolutely not me because on my power, I'm in the bathroom, I'm getting loaded, I'm in rehab, I'm in jail, I'm hiding, I'm making this all about me instead of asking, what can I do for you? And in that moment, I never felt more connected to God and more present than I ever have. And, and not only that is... I got to have a relationship with my sister for a year and a half before she died. Our relationship had been broken for a really long time. And because of the immense process and because of Alcoholics Anonymous, that a relation got amended on a level that I never thought possible. She became one of my dearest friends. She was suffering from, you know, anorexia, and she was able to tell me her deepest, darkest secrets because of the depth and weight of the stories that I shared with her. And for the last year and a half of her life, my sister was a little less alone. And for the rest of my life, I get to carry the memory of my sister and the fact that I got to be her friend. For I, I get to carry that with me. And you guys gave me my sister back. Three weeks ago, I was supposed to get on a plane to fly out here to speak at another meeting. I had gone to bed early and I, I woke up and I looked at my phone and my mother was contacting me to tell me my little brother was dead. My little brother suffered from this disease and I remember when I made amends to my mother I asked my mother what I could do to make this right. And my mother said, I need you to be a living example. <laughs> I need you to be a living example of sobriety for your brother. And two weeks ago, I carried my little brother in a box to his funeral. <laughs> you know, it's funny. My brother and I argued before he died, a month before he died, um, we argued. And it was a pretty bad argument. You know, he called me about, or I called him about something, and 
you know, he made some snarky remark and then I said something and, uh, you know, he said something, well, why don't you just tell me how you really feel? And I said, well, okay, <laughs> here we go. And I, you know, I, I basically told him, I think it's time for you to take accountability. It's not mommy and daddy's fault anymore. Like, come on. And, uh, and I didn't even think, cause I didn't raise my voice. I convinced myself it wasn't that big of a deal. And he got so angry and he hung up on me and he said, I'll never speak to you again. He wasn't lying either. He blocked my number. And, um, you know, I immediately called my sponsor and this is what I'm going to talk to you about, like why sponsorship is so important. I call my sponsor and I'm like, you listen, I, I kind of know I'm wrong here, but I still want to be right. <laughs> like I want, I know I shouldn't have done that, but I have a point, right? So I'm, I'm all right. You know, I was on the phone with my sponsor with this 10 step for about an hour and a half. And by the end of the conversation talking about, it's just his ego versus my ego. And deep down, we really love each other. And I really do see that this, neither one of us want to be this way in this moment. And it's just all fear. She says to me, you know what I need you to do? I need you to try to contact him for the next three days. Okay. And uh, if he doesn't, if he doesn't unblock you, I think you should write him a note. And I said, okay. And, and, you know, thank God at 10 years sober, I can still take direction. And I, three days, I, you know, I said the same thing for three days in a row and he still had me blocked. And then, you know, I, I contacted his girlfriend. I asked for his address and I wrote that note and I only wrote three sentences and I purposely wrote it on a tiny note. So my ego couldn't get in the way and start writing a novel about, wow, you know, I was wrong, but, and I just wrote, <laughs> I just wrote, I was wrong to speak to you that way. You didn't deserve it. I love you very much. And life is too short for us to be angry at each other. And I mailed the note and, uh, the morning he, after he died, I was on the phone with his girlfriend and she told me he read the note and, uh, he said to her, I'm going to keep her blocked for, I'm going to keep her blocked for a couple more weeks. And she said, you know, why? And he said, just cause I can, I just like to make her sweat. <laughs> and it's just who he was. And, um, you know, but thank God, thank God I sent that note. <laughs> Thank God the the need to be right wasn't more important than the need to love my brother in his worst moments. That's what AA shows me and that's what Alcoholics Anonymous gives me. I can't see that on my own. There's no way I can see that on my own. It's not possible. And before I got on the plane to come out here, my mother called me and I asked my mom about the amends. And um, I said, Mom, do you remember when you asked me? What you asked me what I could do to make it right in my amends. And, um, I said, do you think I failed? And my dad was in the car with her and I didn't know it. And they both immediately yelled, no. And my dad said, there's no way you failed. In fact, everybody was shocked that he didn't get it after seeing your transformation from the hell you went from until the, the way your life was transformed. He's like, everybody was shocked that he did, just didn't do what you did. And this is what Alcoholics Anonymous gives me. I was never able to help the people I love the most. But hopefully I can stand up here and some part of my story will touch the heart of somebody sitting in this room who doesn't know what they're suffering from, who doesn't believe they're an alcoholic, who thinks that they can have one more drink, who thinks that they're just not that bad, who thinks that there's no way out, who thinks that they can never believe in a power greater than themselves. Maybe they'll hear something in my story tonight and maybe it'll touch their heart. Maybe they'll stay for one more meeting. I don't know. But that's why I keep showing up. That's why through every single day of this horrific pain, I keep showing up for Alcoholics Anonymous because it's the one thing that saved my life. And there's something deep within me that I can't explain, and it has to be God. That there's this peace within my heart through all this pain. It's like that peace that passes all understanding. Because right now there shouldn't be peace in my heart with my baby brother dead. But there is. There's not anger. There's not fear. There is deep, deep sadness but there is peace and that comes from God. That does not come from me. And that for me is part of being, you know, part of a life beyond my wildest dreams 
because in my wildest dreams, well, I, I, I would never have imagined staying sober through that. Not my wildest dreams. And it's not all awful, by the way. <laughs> I'm just like, be super dark here, but I do also have other amazing things that are happening in my life of, you know, that amends process that, you know, allow, you know, fits us to be of maximum service to God and uh, God and his people. Like that's, that's a real, like the purpose of this amends process. I, my, I am fit to be of maximum service to God and the people around me. So I get to play these roles God assigns me today. And I get to have these relationships with people that I never dreamed possible. Like I get to be a daughter today and I get to show up and I get to be a sister. I get to be a mother to my daughter today. And my mother, my daughter suffered more at the hands of my alcoholism, my, both of my children really than any human beings on the planet. And today my daughter is my best friend in the entire world. My daughter tells me everything and she trusts me with everything. She has a closer bond with me than the man who raised her. And that's not to say that he is not a good man. In fact, I have an amazing relationship with him. I was just telling people at lunch today that I was at my, my ex-husband's wedding. I, I babysit their kid. We celebrate holidays together. This is what Alcoholics Anonymous does for you guys. You get to hang out with your ex-husband <laughs> and not hate his guts. <laughs> But, um, you know, that what a beautiful gift that is, that my daughter gets to see two functioning parents for the first time in her entire life. You know, I got to be with my daughter, like, when she graduated from law school. Yeah. And, you know, we take our annual road trips and we run races together and we have this incredible relationship. And I get to be in the moment and I get to have these experiences with her and I get to be a mother and I finally know what that is. Because before coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, I just had babies. I didn't know what it meant to be a mother. And these children were not brought into this world for, you know, for anything other than to try to fix me. But now you, like, I come to Alcoholics Anonymous and you guys teach me how to do that. You teach me how to be a mother. You teach me how to be present, how to love my daughter for who she is and how she is and not try to fix her or change her or make her different. And thank you for that. You know, I... um came into Alcoholics Anonymous and I was unemployable and I'm an 11 time felon. So I remember, I know, great, big ones too. Uh, <laughs> I remember thinking like there wasn't a chance in hell of me getting a job anywhere. Like that wasn't going to happen. And in the beginning, like I, it was really difficult. I was like, cleaning toilets for a while. And, uh, but, you know, again, like this is what these principles that these perfect principles that I practice very imperfectly teach me how to do. They teach me how to show up. And uh, as a result of me showing up and showing up and showing up, I am a paralegal in a corporate law firm today. How bizarre is that? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> and like the crazy thing about that is, is like, I know that's God because I know in the moment where I'm standing in a courthouse being sworn in as a notary in the same courthouse where I was sent into state prison, that wasn't me. <laughs> I know, like, creeping through the metal detectors, being like, oh, do they know? No. <laughs> um, like, I know I'm not capable of this stuff. Like, I, I look at my life, and, like, God never ceases, to, like, continues to amaze me and amaze me over and over again. And you want to know the insanity of being an alcoholic? I still doubt God. I'll see this. I'll see these miracles on a daily basis, and I'm still like, oh, yeah, no, I have a better way. I'll have... <sighs> Like, I don't like to let go of things that I think are working out for me. I was talking to a friend of mine earlier about this. Like, one of the, my last relationship that I was in, like, I kept saying, God, please remove anything from me that, you know, isn't meant to be in my life. And then all of a sudden, God, like, starts to nudge him. And I'm like, nope, not him. <laughs> Bring him back. You know, it's just that's the kind of insanity of alcoholism. And, and <laughs> you know, I don't know that I'm, I'm like, I don't. I'm never going to be cured. I get, a, I get a daily reprieve contingent on the work that I do here that I have to do religiously. If I am not actively doing a 10th and 11th step, I'm absolutely insane. I'll be sitting at my work desk and I'm convinced my boss is going to fire me for no reason. You know, that's the kind of stuff like I'll wake up in the morning, you know, and my default mode is untreated alcoholism. I have to immediately go to God. But when I do that stuff again, like I get to have these, this life this amazing, amazing life. And, um, and 
I have a son I haven't seen in 15 years. I always talk about this because, um, you know, I used to come in Alcoholics Anonymous and I would hear this thing over and over again, just stay sober long enough and everything comes back, you get everything back. And, you know, coming up on um, like a few years sober, I don't even remember at this point, I was really, really torn up about this. And I had well-meaning people in and out of the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous telling me what I should do and giving me, you know, good, you know, advice, like get a lawyer, do this, like, you know, you never fully lost your rights. You should fight for him. And, um, there is a lot of things that I want to do because I'll tell you what I want to do when it comes to my boy. I know where he lives and on any given day, I want to drive to his house and I want to bang on his door and I want to throw my arms around him and I want to tell him how much I love him and how sorry I am for everything I did. But I will never know the extent of the harm I caused that boy. It is a miracle he is alive having a mother like me. And that is the truth. I'm not even exaggerating. So I don't get to do what I want to do. And coming up on a few years sober, something deep within me told me, like, no, you don't get to do what you, what you want to do in this situation. So I did what the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous asks us to do. And that's, you know... <laughs> Go to God and ask for an intuitive thought or decision. And I asked, and I begged, and I did not relax and take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very bad at that part of it. I try, but I'm just not good at the whole relax and take it easy part. But uh, I asked, and I begged, and I pleaded, and um, and then God showed me. Like I was begging God. It was like I haven't seen him in a decade. I don't even know what he looks like. Can you please show me what to do here? And then all of a sudden, boom. I typed his name into Instagram, and there he was. I saw his face for the first time in 10 years, and my son is beautiful, and he's happy. And he has a wonderful life today. And something happened in my heart. Again, that peace that passes all understanding, that knowing in my heart that the restoration of this relationship is going to happen on God's time and not on mine. And the longer I stay sober and the more work that I do and the more inventory that I do and the more and the closer I get to my creator, the deeper knowing becomes the restoration of this relationship may never look the way I want it to. But God will use this relationship for something so much bigger, I just don't know what that is. And that's what faith looks like for me today. I have hope. I will never give up hope. But I have hope without expectation. And I am no less free. I came in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous with a lot of conditions on what my sobriety was supposed to look like. There's no way I can get and stay sober if I uh, don't get this job or if I don't have this relationship, if I don't get my kids back. I'm not going to get and stay sober if anybody I love dies. But my experience in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says otherwise. It actually says that we need to burn the idea into the consciousness of every person, that we can get well regardless of anyone. Get well. It doesn't even say sober. Because when I do this work, it cleans me from the inside out. A drink becomes unnecessary. I don't need it anymore. Sobriety becomes a byproduct. Because I'm free. And my experience is, when I do this work one day at a time, I can stay well regardless of whether I have my children, of whether I have my siblings, whether I have a job, and whether anything works out on the outside. And that's not how I came in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm not special. I'm not unique. I didn't get this way because, you know, <laughs> I did something magical. I just did the 12 steps. That's it. And I continue to do the 12 steps because this is not a one and done. This is a, you know, this must continue for our lifetime. That's what it says. So one day at a time for the rest of my life, I need to stay in this work. And this same gift that I've experienced, this life beyond my wildest dreams, this ability to have true unconditional sobriety is a gift that is available to every single person here. All we have to do is work for it. I love you all. Thank you so much for having me on.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.